Welcome to Words on Air. I'm Lindsay Smith. Today on our show, Rilla Askew. Rilla Askew is the author of five works of fiction and most recently a collection of essays called Most American, Notes from a Wounded Place. Today, also on the show, Emily Hull. Emily is the principal investigator for the Deep Roots Oklahoma Literary Oral History Project at Oklahoma State University. Emily and Rilla sat down recently to talk about Rilla's latest project, as well as her writing career. Rilla, in this collection of nine linked essays, you cover topics that are very much at the forefront of our national conversation. You cover things such as police brutality, gun culture, white privilege, racism, identity, all through the lens of your experiences with Oklahoma and with being an Oklahoman. And you begin the book with an epigraph by the historian Angie DeBeau. And I'd like to read that quote real quick. The one who can interpret Oklahoma can grasp the meaning of America in the modern world. So how do we interpret Oklahoma? <laughs> <laughs> Carefully. Yes. <laughs> You know, I think that it takes it takes a, a great deal of um, ex self examination. I think that does for the, I mean there there are all kinds of ways that we do it. We do it we do it through the arts. We do it through education. We do it through our narrative um, that we say about ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, uh, which I think that one element that I has been it's one, one thing that I deal with a lot in the essays is how we have. Um, how we have retold the story to ourselves in a way that smooths over some of the worst of our sins, of mm -hmm. both as a as a nation and as a as a state and as a as a culture, dominant culture. So I think that that honesty is a big part of it. I think that storytelling is a big part of it. I think that art's a big part of it. I think that uh, a willingness to to um, to acknowledge our whole the whole truth of our past. And the whole truth of our present, and and not um, not sway too much one direction, which I see sometimes, which is where we condemn ourselves too much, where there's too much self criticism, and, and too much um, sense of saying, well, we're not we're not we're not we're not we're not doing well enough. We're not doing well enough economically. We're not taking care of our people well enough. We're not educating our children well enough. So that's. Uh, one one way we can err on one side, or t to go too far to the other side, which is that says everything is fine, as everything is fine, as long mm -hmm. as oil and gas industry is in good shape, <laughs> we're fine. And um, in fact, that's not necessarily true. So, and then when we, especially something that I deal with a lot as as an historical novelist and as a and just as an Oklahoman um, is, is understanding the truth of our past, right. which is grounded in a lot of violence and a lot of. Um, uh, theft and uh, oppression, and so we, you know, we, our 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 narrative uh, it begins with the Trail of Tears. It begins in in, in heartache. Um, it, it includes the what the event that is sometimes called the Tulsa race riot, the the pogrom that happened um, in Tulsa in 1921. So those those are the founding. Those are part of the founding. Uh, truth of, of, of who we are as a state, um, which reflects the national narrative. Right. And the longest essay in your collection is called A Wounded Place. Mm -hmm. And it so elegantly captures the complexity of Oklahoma's past and reminds us how the past is always in our present in, in one way or the other. And I'd like to invite you to read uh, the opening uh, paragraphs oh, sure. of that. Uh, that's, a, that's a good way of putting it, I think, uh, as you just said. And so it begins with an epigraph by Wendell Berry, a wonderful uh, writer, and uh, it's from his book, The Hidden Wound, that says, The wound is in me, as complex and deep in my flesh as blood and nerves. Oklahoma is a wounded place. The country as a whole is wounded. But my home state, birthed as it was in such profound hope and greed, violence and promise is wounded in a particular way. From the trail of tears to the all-black towns to the rush of white settlement in the land runs, the coming together of black, white, and, and indigenous peoples in the old Indian territory 
created a racial cauldron that boiled over in brutal ways, large and small, in the early part of the 20th century. A hundred years later, we are still living out the legacy, whether we know it or not. And most of us don't know it. Or let me say this, most white people don't know it. Writing in the 1980s, Wendell Berry, that masterful American poet, writer, and thinker called racism our nation's hidden wound. I would qualify the phrase by saying, hidden from white people. Americans of color surely have not found racism to be so hidden. But white America is, I believe, who Wendell Berry was addressing. It's who I'm writing to. I didn't know that for a long time. I didn't think about it, really. Much of my journey as a writer has been in coming to understand that this is so. And I think, in part, it's because I came of age when I did, where I did, that I'm always looking to peel back the scabs dig underneath the scars. I grew up in the 1960s, not far from Tulsa, never having heard a whisper about the racial pogrom that took place there in 1921. In this, I'm no different from the majority of white people, at least of my generation. The silence surrounding the Tulsa race riot was so absolute that I discovered this story only in a young adulthood, and then only by accident. But black people knew. The story of the riot was handed down orally in black families, not all families, but many, and not just in Oklahoma, but all over the country, in direct contradiction to the complicit silence in white communities. So when I think of why the wounds of race won't heal in this country, I think of the fact that for decades, blacks and whites lived and worked in close proximity to one another, with most black people knowing what happened in Tulsa in 1921, and most white people entirely ignorant of it. And that's the nature of the chasm between us. That's the legacy we're still living out, not only in Oklahoma, but all over the country. Just as we're living out our birthrights of slavery and genocide and our homegrown brand of terrorism, massacres and lynchings, we're still living Wounded Knee and Jim Crow, still suffering the long hurt of the boarding schools, the theft of Indian children through forced adoptions. As a nation, we're all living it. But it's only the dominant culture, the so-called normative culture, that doesn't recognize this. Thank you. It's powerful. How do we mend our wounds? Huh. Well, first of all, we have to own that they're there. Yeah. First of all, we have to recognize um, how, how deeply wounded we are and how how self-inflicted so much of this is. I mean, mm -hmm. And when we, look at, when we look at the cultural climate that we're living, the time that we're living in right now, we can see how it, it just, it, it, that wound breaks open at, at the slightest pressure. And uh, we're living in a time where the pressure actually is great. And so we're seeing all kinds of um, instances where, as a, I think as a nation, or at least some of us had sort of thought that, that, that much of that was healed over or at least, um, um, if not healed, at least, I guess, suppressed or bandaged. Yeah. Um, and now it's broke, it seems to me that it's broken open in, in, in powerful ways, uh, in, in both in terms of immigration, when we see um, white supremacists, you know, marching boldly in the streets um, and... Uh, in claiming their racism as a right, as a, as a right of free speech, as a right of, of privilege. And um, so I, I, uh, how, is, how has this come about? It's I think it's because we haven't dealt with the truth of our past. So, um, I, you know, I don't think there's any simple way when you say, how do we, right. I mean, gosh almighty, <laughs> <laughs> you know, read James Baldwin. That's one, that's yes. one thing I would say. Uh, uh, actually, that's one, that is, that's one element. One, mm -hmm. When people say, well, what can I do? I think that that's one, um, uh, one possible inlet. Which, which really has to do with, with uh, reading one another's work and engaging with one another's work in terms of uh, what, what artists are saying, mm -hmm. what writers are saying. And I think that uh, when, when Fire in Beulah, which is a novel I wrote about the Tulsa race riot, uh, first came out, I, there were 
a number of readers, uh, mostly white women, who said to me that they felt that they under, th this is part of what I mean about knowing that my audience is white, yes. not, not simply be, by circumstance, I'm, I mean that that's who, that's who I'm talking to, uh, is, is, uh, is my contemporaries, it's my peers, it's other people who've grown up within what I call the presumptions of whiteness, the, the, you know, the privileges, but particularly the, the presumptions, the, the vision of the world that is, that is um, shaped by growing up within the dominant culture. So th it happened that there were women who would say to me, I feel as if, after reading your, your book, I feel as if I understand the effects of uh, segregation in a way that I didn't before. So th th these are women who grew up in my same era, grew up in a, in a segregated era uh, through the, the early beginnings of desegregation um, in the civil rights movement. And, and so they were saying that I felt that I understood it f from the inside for the first time. And what I understood when they told me that is that it's because you're, you haven't read Alice Walker and you haven't read Toni Morrison and you haven't read James Baldwin for, what, for whatever reason. I mean, there's, I'm not, I don't mean that as a criticism of them. I just mean right. that, that, that an, it is another way of seeing the world and, and experiencing it from, um, from outside our own, our own um, limited vision. Yeah, and an unexamined consciousness is an unexamined language. Words have power, they mm -hmm. have weight, they have a history. And you kind of mentioned that um, a, a little bit in um, your essay, Geronimo. But I also wanted to um, ask you this. So we were at a talk um, together not too long ago in Stillwater, and there was a moment in the audience where we were talking about why the state can be so generous and kind on the one hand, but then just so polarized, mm -hmm. so polarized and, and cruel and mean sometimes on, mm -hmm. on the other hand. And there was a student who stood up who was trying to I explain the point and this person explained this place by using an, an old word from academia, from anthropology actually called tribalism. Mm -hmm. And immediately another student who was Native American said, wait, mm -hmm. don't use that word. And mm -hmm. here's why. And it was just, it was this moment of seeing someone who meant no, no harm by that mm -hmm. word. But it was a moment of unawareness of white privilege mm -hmm. that just kind of happened there. And white privilege is something that you talk a lot about in your book. And it just made me think of your... Uh, of what you've written about um, your godson, Travis, for example. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us just a little bit about how knowing him and maybe his experiences with the police kind of open your eyes to how you live differently? Yes, so we're, what we're speaking of and people who, who read this book or pro actually anybody mm -hmm. who knows me very much will, will know uh, about the relationship I have with um, my godson and godchildren's uh, family, their mom, um, Marlene, uh, was one, she was actually one of my students when I taught at Brooklyn College years ago, and she became um, very close to me, and so her, I became godmother to her son, and then later to her daughters, Ebony and Essie. So, but speaking specifically of Travis, who's mm -hmm. like in his 20s now, he's like 27, yeah. um, so I watched him grow up, and I really helped um, I mean, he, he stayed at my house all the time. I was, you know, it, was, it wasn't a distant godmother. It wasn't godmother in name. It was almost like, you know, extra grandma or mm -hmm. something. And um, so, so that experiencing of loving a young black man growing up actually in Brooklyn, uh, so it's not in the deep south. It's not in places that we, where we presume there's going to be so right. much racial bias. Uh, and, and watching the the challenges that that he experienced, which I write a, a, a lot about, the racial profiling, the um, his um, the, the violence that happened, really not so much against him, but police violence against his father, his stepfather. Um, so l living that life for you know almost thirty years now it has given me an insight into what it's, I mean, just a tiny insight, mm -hmm. uh, but but a closer insight than, than most um, people from the dominant culture are privileged to understand. But, but a tiny insight in comparison to what mother, all mothers, all black mothers, all native mothers, um, uh, Hispanic mothers, uh, mothers of color in this country 
the fears that they have for their sons, um, for their children in general. The, 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 the violence against women is a different issue, but I'm speaking of particularly of police violence in this case. Um, it's not a different issue, it's, but the manifestations of it are, are sometimes different when, I, when we speak about violence against women, and, 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 and especially women of color. So uh, I, I would say that that um, experience of, of love and family has changed me. It shaped me in, in profound ways, and it shaped my vision of, of, of uh, the truth of this, of this nation, and then particularly of also of, the, of this state and, and of our story. Um, those, those are circumstances that just, um, I, I was already open to it be, because I had grown up during the civil rights era and I'd grown up with a sort of sentimental white liberal understanding of what that meant. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it was, it was surface and it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't have any of the grit that, that you begin to experience when you have close ties of family and, and love with, with uh, somebody who, who experiences the institutional racism and the um, economic racism and all, all the layers of it that exist in this country to this day. Um, that's, that's the difference. So it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not theory. <laughs> right, yeah, well, thank you for that. And thank you for taking the time to talk with us today, Rolette, and thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.